guys, it's Nurse Jack, Nursing the Truth. I hope everyone's having a great day. So this is my second video today. We're going to jump right on into it. The Stolen Legacy and how the Egyptians educated the Greeks. So this is a book that you can find on the internet, Stolen Legacy, and it is by George G.M. James. He wrote it in 1954, and this is chapter 4. And it starts off in chapter 4 about the Persian conquest. And, um, you know, owing to the practice of piracy in which the Ionians and Carians were active, the Egyptians were forced to make immigration laws restricting the immigration of the Greeks and punishing their infringement by capital punishment, i.e. the sacrifice of the victim before the time of Simon. Zamantius, that's a, um, a, a, a pharaoh. The Greeks were not allowed to go beyond the coast of Lower Egypt, but during his reign and that of Amasis, those conditions are modified. Excuse me. For the first time in Egyptian history, the Ionians and Carians were employed as mercenaries in the Egyptian army in 670 BCE. Interpretation was organized through a body of interpreters, and the Greeks began to gain useful information concerning the culture of the Egyptians. So, friends, before this 670 BCE, they really didn't know anything about them. I mean, they would have trade and commerce and so on and so forth, but they really didn't know the civilization. So, and as you know, you know, Egypt had to keep their borders safe as well. So, now we're going to go down here. And the genesis of the Greek Enlightenment. So, the Persian invasion did not only provide the Greeks with ample research, but stimulated the creation of the history of Ionia. Therefore, the Greeks had little or no accurate knowledge of Egyptian culture, but their contract with Egypt resulted in the genesis of their enlightenment, states Herodotus and Plutarch and Strabo. The students from Ionia and the islands of the Aegean visit Egypt for their education. What? Hold on. Who taught who first? Was it Egypt teaching Greek or Greek teaching Egypt? Sorry, friends. The cat's out of the bag. Written right here to tell you that Egypt is the light of the world. So, there always has to be a beginning. So, just like the modern times in the United States, England and France are attracting students from all over the parts of the world and on account of their leadership and their skills, just like it was in ancient times, Egypt was the supreme in the leadership of the civilization. And the students from all parts of the world flock to that wonderful land seeking admission into the mysteries and wisdom systems. You know, friends, wouldn't that be awesome right now in the United States to go learn abroad in Egypt and sit under their temples and talk to their shamans and their mystery teachers that would be phenomenal the immigration of Greeks to Egypt for the purpose of their education began as a result of the Persian invasion in 525 BCE and continued until the Greeks gained possession of that land and access to the royal library through the conquest of Alexander Alexandria was then converted into a Greek city, a center of research and a capital of the newly created Greek Empire under the rule of the Ptolemies. 
The Egyptian culture survived and flourished under the name and control of the Greeks until the edicts of Theodosius in the 4th century AD and that of Justinian in the 6th century AD, which closed all the mystery temples and schools as elsewhere mentioned. That's sick. You have now the Roman Empire under Theodosius and Justinian and they closed it down. Oh my. Were they threatened, friends? Yes. Concerning that the fact that Egypt was the greatest educational center in all the ancient world, which was also visited by the Greeks, reference must again be made to Plato in Timaeus, who tells us that the Greek aspirants to wisdom visited Egypt for initiation and that the priest of Sais used to refer to them as children in the mysteries. As regard to the visits of Greek students to Egypt for the purpose of their education, the following are mentioned simply to establish the fact that Egypt was regarded as the educational center of the ancient world and like the Jews, the Greeks, also who visited Egypt and received their education. It is said during the reign of Amasis, Thales, who was said to have been born around 585 BCE, visited Egypt and was initiated by the Egyptian priest at the mystery system and the science of the Egyptians. We also were told that during his residence in Egypt, he learned astronomy, land surveying, engineering, and Egyptian theology. It is also said that Pythagoras, a native of Samos, traveled frequently to Egypt for the purpose of his education. Like every um, person, he had to secure the consent in favor of the priests first, and then we are informed by Diogenes that a friendship existed between Polycrates and Samos and the king of Egypt. The Polycrate gave Pythagoras letters of introduction to the king who secured for him an introduction to the priesthood first to the priest of Heliopolis then the priest of Memphis and lastly to the priest of Thebes to each of whom Pythagoras gave a silver goblet as recorded in Herodotus and Pliny and Diogenes so he was a priest of three different places in Egypt. Wow, what a smart man he was. And who better to teach mathematics than God thought to Pythagoras. Now we are also further informed through Herodotus and Pliny that after several trials, including circumcision, had been imposed upon him by the Egyptian priest, he was finally initiated into all of their secrets. He learned the doctrine of metapsychosis, of which there was no trace before in the Greek religion. That his knowledge of medicine and strict system of dietetic rules distinguished him as a product of Egypt, where medicine had attained its highest perfection, and that his attainments in geometry corresponded with the ascertained fact that Egypt was the birthplace of that science. Yes, thank you, God Thoth. In addition, we have the statements of Plutarch, Demetrius, Antithenes, and Pythagoras founded the science of mathematics among the Greeks, and that he sacrificed to the Muses when the priest explained to him the properties of the right-angled triangle. Wow. Pythagoras had to learn it from someone, didn't he? And he learned it from the priest. And who do you think the priest learned it from? God Thoth. And God Thoth learned it from the great creative conscious force. So it goes back, friends.
Do your tracing of your steps and it will lead you back home. In this respect, we further learn from origin that circumcision was compulsory and one of the necessary conditions of initiation to a knowledge or of the hieroglyphics of the sciences of the Egyptians, it is obvious that Democritus, in order to obtain such knowledge, must have submitted also to that right. Origen, who was a native of Egypt, writes as follows. No one among the Egyptians either studied geometry or investigated the secrets of astronomy unless circumcision had been undertaken. So until you were circumcised, you could not study any of those secrets. Plato visited Euclid at Megara in company with other pupils of Socrates, and that for the next 10 years, he visited Cyrene, Italy, and finally Egypt, where he received instruction from the Egyptian priest. In regards to Socrates and Aristotle, the majority of the pre-Socratic philosophers History seems to be silent on the question of their traveling to Egypt like the few other students here mentioned. For the purpose of their education, it is enough to say that in this case the exceptions have proved the rule that all students who had the means went to Egypt to complete their education. The fact that history fails to supply a fuller account of this type of immigration might be due to some or all of the following reasons. The immigration laws against the Greeks up to the time of the king and the Persian invasion, the history was undeveloped among the Greeks during the period of their educational immigration to Egypt. The Greek authorities persecuted and drove students of philosophy into hiding and consequently students of the mystery system concealed their movement. The effects of the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great, the royal library and museum together with temples and other libraries are looted. As elsewhere mentioned, it was ancient custom of invading armies to loot libraries, temples in order to capture books and manuscripts, which were regarded as great treasures. Not only did they rape the women and looted all through thieves and took and did murder. It was pillaged. We're informed that during the Persian invasion, beginning with Cambyses, the temples of Egypt were not only stripped of their gold and silver, but rifled for their ancient records. Every Egyptian temple carried a secret library with secret manuscripts and books. We are also informed that when Athens was captured by the Romans in 84 BC, the library of books said to have belonged to Aristotle was also captured and taken to Rome. Just as the invasion of Egypt by the Persians, the invading army stripped the temples and did all of that. Also, they took the sacred books and manuscripts, kept both in libraries and in the Holy of Holy of Temples. The author said it is his firm belief that this intended was a great, great opportunity for Alexander that gave Aristotle and enabled him and his pupils to carry off as many books as they wanted from the Royal Library and to convert 
it into a research center. Apart from the Royal Library at Alexander, or Alexandria, there was also another famous library near the Royal Library of Thebes. Huh. Wow, I had no idea about that, guys. I had no idea of the Royal Library of Thebes called the Menippian, the Menemphion, Menemphion, which was founded by Pharaoh Seti. The Menemphion was completed by Ramesses II, but little occurs in history about this greatest of Egyptian royal library. Hell no, because you've taken it and you have destroyed it. Ramesses II was the longest reigning pharaoh of Egypt of 66 years. He had 90 children. And he set up great things in Egypt. It is therefore an erroneous belief that the Greeks on Egyptian soil and through their own naive ability set up a great university at Alexandria and turned out great scholars. On the other hand, though, since it is a well-known fact that Egypt was the land of temples and libraries, we can see how comparatively easy it was for the Greeks to strip other Egyptian libraries of their books in order to maintain the new library at Alexandria. Well, hell yeah! You take everything that wasn't yours and then you stamp a name on it. After it had already been looted by Aristotle and his pupils. The Greeks did not carry any type of culture or learning to Egypt, but found it already there and wisely settled in that country in order to absorb as much as possible. The Royal Library of Thebes, as it was described, it was looted by the invading armies. We see in the Thebian Royal Library something far more magnificent and far more representative of the true greatness of our ancient Egypt. On the left of the steps leading to the second court, there is still seen the pedestal of the enormous granite statue of Ramesses. I've seen it. I have a picture of it. The largest that has ever existed in Egypt according to Diodorus. Its height has been calculated at 54 feet and its weight of 887 and a fourth tons, a marvel to the modern mind. The interior face of the wall of the pylon represents the wars of Ramesses III. In another sculpture, the two chief divinities of Egypt invest him with emblems of military and civil dominion. Beneath 23 sons of Ramesses appearing in procession, bearing the emblems of their representative high office and state, their names being inscribed above them. Nine smaller apartments, two of them still preserved and supported by columns laid behind the hall. On the jams of the first of these apartments are sculptured Thoth, the inventor of letters, and the goddess Saf, with the title of Lady of Letters and President of the Hall of Books, accompanying the former 
with an emblem of the sense of sight and the ladder of hearing. There is no doubt that this is the sacred library, which Diodorus describes as the inscribed dispenser, dispensary of the mind. It had an astronomical ceiling in which the twelve Egyptian months are represented with an inscription from which important references have been drawn respecting the chronological reign of Ramesses III. The Egyptians were the first to civilize the Greeks. Greece was first civilized by colonies from Egypt, then from Phoenicia and Thrace. These were under the government of wise men who were not only subdued of an ignorant populace by civil institutions, but also cast about them the strong chain of religion and the fear of the gods. Where have we went wrong? Where have we went wrong? Whatever dogmas they had been taught in their respective countries concerning things divine and human, they delivered to these newly formed societies with the object of bringing them under the restraint of virtuous discipline. Pharaonius and Cecrops were Egyptians, Cadmus a Phoenician, and Orpheus a Thracian, and each of them through their colonies carried into Greece the religious and philosophical tenets of his respective country. The practice of teaching these doctrines of religion to people under the guise of myths originated from the Egyptians and was adopted by the Phoenicians and Thracians and sub subsequently introduced to the Greeks. According to Strabo, it was not possible in ancient times to lead a promiscuous multitude to religion and virtue by philosophical hang-ups. This could be affected only by the aid of superstition, prodigies, and fables. The thunderbolt, the trident, the spear, the torches, and snakes were the instruments made use of by the founders of states to terrify the ignorant and vulgar into subjection. These references must speak for themselves. Cheops and key crops were the names which the Greeks used for the Egyptian Khufu who belonged to the fourth dynasty of the Egyptians of the Pyramid Age. Alexander visits the Oracle of Amun in the Oasis of Siwa. No discussion on Alexander's invasion of Egypt would be complete without reference to his famous visit to the Oracle of Amun, situated in the Oasis of Siwa. Alexander had placed a garrison in Pelusium whence he marched to the desert along the eastern bank of the Nile to Heliopolis, where he crossed the river to Memphis, where his fleet had been awaiting him and where he was welcomed by the Egyptian and crowned as Pharaoh. He was their savior that was spoken about in the book of Isaiah chapter 19. Having sacrificed to the Apis bull and other gods, Alexander descended the Nile by the Canopic branch and set out his journey to the Oracle of Amun and the Oasis of Siwa. His route was along the coast of Libya and as far as Praetorium, whence he marched through the desert of the Oasis of Siwa. What do we suppose was Alexander's motive for visiting the Temple of Amun? Perhaps a brief description of the religious and economic importance of Heliopolis, Memphis, Thebes, Ammonia, might help us determine what it was. In the first place, these cities were strongholds of the Egyptians' religion, where there were many rich temples, schools, and priests, and therefore were representatives of the religion of the Egyptians. 
In the second place, these cities were centers of education. And after the Persian invasion, Greek students who traveled to Egypt for the purpose of their education received their training from the priest of one of all these cities mentioned. When Pythagoras went to Egypt, he carried a letter of introduction from Polycrates of Samos to the king, who in turn gave him letters of introduction to the priest of Heliopolis, Memphis, and Thebes. As centers of education, the temples and libraries of these cities contained very valuable books. And in the third place, these regions had previously been captured by the Persians for the very fact of their wealth. This should explain why these included these districts and which paid them an enormous annual tribute of 700 talents of gold. Together with the produce of fisheries of Lake Morris, which amounted to a talent a day. During the six months that the water flowed in from the Nile and a third part of that sum during the afflux. In addition, Egypt furnished 120,000 medicine of corn as rations for the Persian troops who were stationed in the white fort of Memphis. According to history, the Persians were in occupation of Egypt and Alexander, having mustered superior forces, went there and drove them out of their possession for himself. May I ask the question, was this a joke or was this a motive? And if this was a motive, what else could it have been but that Alexander wanted the wealth in his books, gold, silver, ivory, slaves, and tribute, which the Persians were extorting from the unfortunate Egyptians. In the ancient times, the Oracle of Amun at Siwa was the most celebrated, and Heliophilus, Memphis, Thebes were representatives of the best of Egyptian culture. So see friends, when you know history and you have education and you have power of knowledge, knowledge is power. So friends, as you know, ancient Egypt was the light of the world and the world has given it its not fair share. We, the people, our ancestors, has done a great, great, great injustice to these people. The indigenous people that have been here for thousands of years before the rest of the world could even do an alphabet, could even know how to cook could even know how to do any type of writing. So people, I'm here to tell you that the rocks are crying out and the temples are getting ready to shake, rattle, and roll, friends. And the pyramids are looking up to the Almighty. And in its day, when it's time, the creative force will strike down to the Pyramid of Giza and its vibration will hit to the world. As Godthal said in Pulmandries, he said that Egypt is heaven on earth. And it is in the center of the universe. Hotep and Asheim. And always search for the truth. Have a great day, guys. Goodbye.